Inside the last few thousand feet of every lunar landing, the entire Apollo program hung on tiny bursts of fire. Sixteen small thrusters, each no larger than a bicycle pump, and producing about a hundred pounds of thrust, kept the lunar module steady as it descended toward a world no spacecraft had ever touched. These weren't the engines that carried astronauts across space. They weren't the engines that slowed the lunar module for landing. They weren't even the engines that lifted the crew off the moon. But without them, nothing else would have worked. During powered descent, the lunar module fought gravity, dust, uneven thrust, and unpredictable motion. The descent engine provided the raw braking force. But the attitude, the balance, the fine control, the entire dance of pitch, yaw, and roll that kept the spacecraft upright and alive, that belonged to the reaction control system. Small engines, instant ignition, hypergolic fire spitting from four corners of the most fragile spacecraft NASA ever flew. This is the story of the Lunar Module's Reaction Control System, the system that never sought glory but saved every landing. The Reaction Control System, or RCS, was the Lunar Module's attitude control array. It lived in four clusters, called quads, mounted around the ascent stage. Each quad held four thrusters arranged so the LM could rotate or translate in any direction. Sixteen jets in total, a full sphere of authority. The lunar module had no wings, no air, no atmosphere to work with. It flew in vacuum. All control had to come from Newton's third law, applied precisely through instantaneous pulses of propellant. Each thruster produced roughly 100 pounds of thrust, a gentle push by aerospace standards, yet more than enough to twist and tilt the ascent stage with the torque needed to maintain a stable attitude. The RCS fed from the same propellant types used across the Apollo stack, aerozine's 50 fuel and nitrogen tetraoxide oxidizer, hypergolic propellants. They ignite the moment the two fluids meet. No spark plugs, no complicated ignition system, just raw chemical inevitability. That reliability was essential. Every pulse had to fire. No questions, no second chances. The quads were intentionally placed high on the ascent stage to maximize rotational authority. Engineers wanted as much lever arm as possible between the thrusters and the spacecraft's center of mass. This gave them more torque for less propellant. It was delicate, elegant physics wrapped in tanks, valves, and plumbing that had to survive lunar vacuum, cabin heat cycles, and the violent separation from the descent stage. Each RCS engine was a small masterpiece of aerospace pragmatism. At first glance, it looked almost primitive a short cylinder, a tiny injector plate, and a rough textured combustion chamber that tapered into a narrow nozzle. But every part existed because earlier versions had failed spectacularly. Inside the injector, fuel and oxidizer entered through separate channels and met across a grid of drilled orifices arranged to atomize the liquids. The mixture had to combust instantly without instability. The geometry prevented oscillations, chugging, and hammering that could destroy the chamber from the inside. The chamber wasn't actively cooled. There was no room. Instead, engineers chose a blade of construction. 
layers of resin impregnated silica fibers were built up so the chamber would slowly burn away from the inside. Ablation requires tight control. Too thick and the engine becomes heavy. Too thin and the chamber erodes too quickly, risking structural collapse. Too uneven and the thrust profile changes mid-flight. The LM's RCS thrusters were designed to last the mission with margin, but not extravagance. They needed to survive precise attitude pulses during descent, landing, ascent, and rendezvous. Nothing more. If the crew demanded too much continuous burn, the chamber temperature would spike, the ablative layer would peel, and the nozzle could rupture. Fortunately, the guidance computer and flight procedures ensured pulses remained short, milliseconds, sometimes less. A sharp flick of flame extinguished before the chamber could overheat. That rhythm kept the spacecraft dancing. The RCS shared the lunar module's primary propellant supply. Both fuel and oxidizer were held under pressure in spherical tanks. The pressure came from helium stored in a separate tank, expanded into the feed lines through regulators. Hypergolics are unforgiving. They corrode metals. They leak easily. They demand perfect sealing. Even a hairline flaw becomes a slow-motion failure. The lunar module engineers confronted this with redundancy at every turn. Each quad had its own valves, lines, and regulators. A single quad failure left the spacecraft fully controllable. Losing two quads, depending on the pair, introduced controllability issues but did not guarantee disaster. Only a catastrophic system-wide breach could eliminate attitude control. The plumbing was routed so the loss of one line wouldn't drain the entire system. Check valves isolated faults. Filters caught debris that could clog injectors. Every burst of fire depended on that entire chain working flawlessly. Attitude control is invisible until it fails. On the lunar module, it never did. The descent was where the RCS earned its keep. As the lunar module pitched forward during the braking phase of power descent, the thrusters had to counteract torque from the descent engine. The engine gimbaled for control but the LM shape produced uneven drag from the engine plume impinging against the landing gear and descent stage. In vacuum, this still produced subtle forces. The RCS compensated constantly. The guidance computer calculated attitude errors dozens of times per second. When it sensed drift, it commanded pulses, short, sharp, surgical. A correction might be a pulse of 10 milliseconds, sometimes less. As the lunar module approached the surface, the dust cloud complicated everything. Dust thrown upward by the descent engine hit the underside of the vehicle. The LM's frame bounced micro-vibrations through the structure. The computer sensed the jitter and smoothed it through RCS corrections. During Apollo 11, the problem of long horizontal drift forced Armstrong to take manual control. He needed to fly forward, find smooth ground, and maintain pitch while burning fuel at a dangerous rate. Every tilt, every nudge, every small adjustment he made was being quietly supported by RCS jets firing in rapid counterpulses. If the RCS had been sluggish, imprecise, or underpowered, Armstrong's manual flight would not have worked. Engineers later estimated the lunar module attitude would have diverged dangerously within seconds without stable RCS performance. Once the landing was complete, the RCS became vital in a new way. 
When the crew prepared for liftoff, the ascent engine had no gimbal. It was fixed. There was no way to steer through the ascent engine itself. The entire ascent stage steered by vectoring its attitude with the RCS. If the ascent stage pitched incorrectly during ignition, it could tip the thrust vector off axis, wasting energy or pushing the spacecraft into a dangerous trajectory. At ignition, the explosive bolts fired, the ascent engine lit, dust flew, and the RCS fired in a precise sequence to trim the initial motion. During the climb to orbit, the RCS kept the ascent stage locked to the correct pitch program. Any oscillation or rotation would ruin the rendezvous geometry. Docking with the command module required precision measured in degrees and milliseconds. The ascent stage had limited propellant. The RCS had limited authority. Everything had to be perfect. And it always was. Docking was where the RCS became almost poetic. Fine control, tiny pulses, almost invisible precision. The lunar module approached the command module at only a few inches per second. Any overcorrection could cause a bounce or misalignment. The RCS valves opened for pulses so short they sometimes didn't register on analog meters. Astronauts described the lunar module as light on the stick, responsive, agile, almost impatient. That handling came from the reaction control system. The ascent stage was light and compact. The jets had excellent leverage. Pilots loved it. Every docking filmed in Apollo history is, in a quiet way, an RCS performance. This is where the system earned its legend. Apollo 11. During the last thousand feet, the LM began to drift. Armstrong saw the boulder field, initiated manual control, and began flying sideways. The descent engine was fixed. The RCS compensated for every attitude change working overtime to stabilize the LM while the crew searched for a safe site. Flight footage shows the jets firing rapidly as Armstrong controlled pitch and yaw manually. Without flawless RCS behavior, he would have lost attitude. A crash would have followed. Apollo 12. After the lightning strikes during launch, the spacecraft systems had been stressed. During descent, the LM required tighter control to hold attitude in the final phase. The RCS delivered exactly the authority needed. Apollo 14. When the landing radar failed to lock on initially, the guidance computer held the LM steady using RCS pulses while the crew reset systems. Without stable attitude, the radar wouldn't have reacquired. The RCS bought time. Apollo 15. The most aggressive descent profile of the program. With heavier payloads and a tilted landing site, the LM required sharp, constant attitude correction. The RCS compensated for slope, drift, and last-second adjustments. Without it, the LM might have slid or tipped. In every case, the RCS didn't just contribute, it kept the mission alive. RCS testing often looked like controlled destruction. Early prototypes cracked under heat spikes. Some developed combustion instability. 
Some erupted in small plasma flares that shredded their chambers. Engineers tried hundreds of injector geometries. They tested ablative layers of different thicknesses. They experimented with chamber lengths, nozzle angles, insulation, and feed pressures. Vacuum tests revealed problems no earthbound system could predict. In vacuum, ablative layers behaved differently. Heat transfer changed. Ignition lag vanished. Oscillations amplified. After dozens of redesigns, the final thrusters became bulletproof. They needed to be. The RCS was one of the few lunar module systems with no backup beyond built-in redundancy. If the RCS couldn't stabilize the spacecraft, nothing else mattered. Even with NASA's engineering rigor, failures were planned for. If a thruster stuck open, the lunar module would begin an uncontrolled rotation. The guidance computer would detect divergence, isolate the fault, and pulse opposite jets to counteract the rotation. The propellant penalty was enormous, so mission rules restricted operations in this condition. If a thruster failed closed, the system simply redistributed control authority. The lunar module could lose multiple thrusters and still fly. Only the catastrophic loss of an entire quad threatened mission success. Even then, the lunar module could often remain controllable depending on which quad failed and which maneuvers were required. During Apollo, no in-flight RCS thruster ever failed to the point of endangering the crew. A flawless record. The lunar module's RCS became a blueprint for the next half century. The shuttle's vernier thrusters carried forward many lunar module design lessons so did the attitude thrusters on Orion. Commercial spacecraft still rely on hypergolic RCS engines built on the same fundamental principles. Attitude control systems across aerospace engineering share DNA from these small Apollo thrusters. The lunar module's RCS wasn't a side system. It was a masterclass in minimal mass, high reliability, instant response and precision thrust. The hardware may have been small, but its legacy remains enormous. The lunar module is remembered for its spindly legs, its descent engine, its fragile skin. But look closer at the footage of every landing, every ascent, every docking, you will see tiny bursts of fire puffing from four corners of the spacecraft. Sixteen small engines, almost invisible, yet indispensable. These were the sparks that steadied the first human spacecraft to land on another world. The quiet force that kept Apollo balanced between success and catastrophe. The tiny hands that held the moon landings steady. The lunar module's reaction control system saved every landing. It just never asked for credit.